Hi, and warm welcome everyone to Sustainability Explored, a podcast where we discover and explore different shapes and angles of sustainability in business and economy. A place where we make complicated concepts easy and understandable, where buzzwords like climate change, environment, green economy, and so on, finally start making sense. This is the 19th episode, season two. Today I'd like to look at the ESG, that stands for Environmental, Social and Governance, three central factors in measuring the sustainability and societal impact of an investment in a company or business. These criteria normally help to better determine the future financial performance of companies, such as return and risks. But how exactly does it work? Of course, there, there is no better way to find out about these things rather than directly asking a professional working in this field. Therefore, for this interview episode, I invited Andrew Gazal, a founder of ESG Tech, a new technology solution to support frameworks like United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, uh, Principles for Responsible Banking, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, TCFD, or Task Force on Climate-Related Disclosures, and SASB a Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Um, ESG Tech is a platform which simplifies ESG reporting for corporations in all sectors. And I'm very excited to invite uh, Andrew today to be my guest at, at this podcast. He will tell us everything that he knows and share his wisdom on ESGs. Before we start, here is a short musical pause for you. So, my guest today is Andrew Gazal. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for joining Sustainability Explored today. You can briefly introduce yourself to before we kick off. Terrific. Well, first, thank you for having me, Anna. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Andrew Gazal. I'm the CEO and founder of ESG Tech. ESG Tech is a bespoke cloud-based platform where we simplify ESG reporting for corporations and our overall goal is to be able to structure and aggregate data collecting for investors and banks in order to refine risk and investment tools. How did you get to this topic? Were you Are you a trained environmentalist? What's your background? Yep, so I'm an engineer by trade. I studied naval architecture, which takes care of anything on the water or beneath the seabed. I spent over 10 years in the oil and gas sector, so a high-risk, heavy industry sector, where I was focused on operational risk, so very much looking at operational risk of projects all across the globe. With that in mind, later in my career in oil and gas, I was then tasked to investigate and find projects in emerging markets where we would need to look at financial risk from the borrower and lender scenario or investors and operational risk from a commercial perspective. And with that, we started. I started to see that questions were being asked from, from the stakeholders about ESG or environmental social governance. And very early in my career, I was like, okay, well, what is ESG? And very quickly, I found out that it's essentially operational risk, but focusing on metrics that are specific to, to an industry. So with that in mind, I set on my ways to, to leave the corporate world and begin ESG Tech, where we help communicate ESG between corporations in all industries and sectors with the financial markets. Oh, very cool. Did you have any tech background or do you have any other people in your team dealing with that? How big is the team also? Yeah, so I have a CTO who is also now a co-founder. His name is Austin Chad, who has 15 years of, of experience building enterprise software for the banking sector. So he's worked for the likes of Macquarie Bank, JP Morgan. So together we complement each other in the sense where he understands technology stack and how the financial markets deal with legacy systems and an interface with corporate clients. Where on my side, over the years, I've expanded my knowledge and understanding of operational risk into quite a few industries, oil and gas, mining, apparel, renewable energy, Everything that essentially is topics of today is something which I take my engineering and analytical thinking and put a ESG lens on it for 
for the financial market so that they can see operational risk in the metrics that they look at. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the financial markets, by the way, in which way the financial markets, the banks would need ESGs, environmental, social governance data? Why? Yep. So the way that I look at ESG, I actually assess it as what we call non-financial risk. So everything that's not found on the financial balance sheet. In my personal opinion, I think that we'll soon see financial reports being called corporate reports, and they will have both financial statements or financial content and non-financial risk content, which is the ESG component. And the reason for that is because for a business to truly be understood and seeing its its operational skills and risk, you need to be able to overlay both the financial content and the risk of the business. And those risks now are just being brought into the environmental, social and governance. So whether it's risk or opportunity, They're now metrics which for a long time were not asked by the financial sector, was very much understanding P&L of a business, liquidity, debt equity ratios, and comprising an understanding and a rating of a company purely based on on those financial criteria. Yeah. And then how did they start to merge and why, why should they be motivated? The companies and the banks, why would they be motivated to look at the non-financial data? Yeah, so in my opinion, I think the reason why the financial markets are looking at this is stakeholder pressure. So we're seeing large multinational banks being pushed from their major stakeholders, which in most cases are pension funds, mutual funds, sovereign funds, to say that you as a bank or as at least the board have a fiduciary responsibility not only to provide profits to shareholders, but also to ensure that it's done in a sustainable manner. And when they talk about sustainable manner, it looks at the longevity of a business and what its impacts will have on environmental metrics, social metrics, and governance in terms of how they run and operate their business. From so, a, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, sorry, no, you go. Stakeholders was a big topic at this year World Economic Forum. And yeah, we start to focus more and more what on what other people want, the communities globally. I wanted to ask you, from your experience with ESG tech, how easy it is for companies and banks that you are working with to perceive this information, to really say, yeah, you're right. We also feel the the pressure from the stakeholders. We want to operate in the sustainable way. We want to include other metrics. How do they, you know, how easy do they react globally or not? And where are mostly your clients based? Yeah, so I think from a banking perspective, I think you need to divide it into into two categories. There is the ESG component of the bank themselves as a corporation. So you're seeing how they're ranked on the Rebecco Sam and uh, against their competitors. But then there's more of a push now for a bank to place metrics in the ESG format or non-financial risk on deployed capital. So debt or credit lending and what the effects of that, that funding does to, to the environment or to to society. That second part is quite key and, and that's where we focus at ESG Tech is there is recently, well not recently now, I should say it's um, time flies, but last year the United Nations Principles of Responsible Bankings were released and there are several principles under the framework. But one of the main principles is for banks to set KPIs and targets and then to show and publicly disclose their efforts to achieve those targets. And we're moving away from banks looking at, okay, their energy consumption for branches and main offices to now looking at, well, are we supporting sustainable or non-sustainable businesses? And can we help these businesses transfer to a sustainable product or a sustainable service? And then look at limiting or expanding lending products towards them. And the best way I feel that to do that is obviously always by incentivizing corporate clients. So we all know that corporate clients react best when cheaper capital is offered. And we hope to see those mechanisms come to play where being sustainable and and setting KPI-linked loans would then offer corporates to receive discounted capital, which then from a financial perspective would help their business thrive as well. Mm -hmm. So do banks impose the ESG reporting on their clients or not? So to this day, we've seen and, and our market research shows that 
banks and NGOs have more of a criteria per industry where they have a yes or no scenario or a survey where they ask corporates, do they have a ESG strategy? Do they select specific metrics? Are they tracked? What's the framework in terms of liability and i.e. who's responsible at a board level, at a C-suite level and at a management level? But we're not seeing, apart from the few new KPI linked loans, where there is quantitative metrics that are set set by banks or set with their corporate clients and link them to debt facilities. So if they don't achieve the KPIs, then there is penalty fees. If they do, then they continue to benefit in the case that I mentioned before, in, for instance, discounted capital or extended credit lines. You mentioned metrics a couple of times. I think for the listeners, it would be beneficial to know what exactly, how can exactly you measure environment, like environmental part of your business, social and especially governance. Even I'm confused on the last one. (laughs) No, look, that's a great question. And at ESG Tech, we are a big advocate for SASB, which is the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. It's a non-for-profit organization that was set up in the United States and it took seven years to develop. And the reason was that they went about setting a framework that creates or or selects metrics that are industry-specific and investor-focused. So there's over 90-plus industries that essentially any corporation can be categorized into, and then they determine metrics that best suit that industry for what the financial markets would be interested to look at from a non-financial risk perspective or, again, ESG. An example of environmental, we all know of greenhouse gas emissions, so looking at how much a corporate emits scope one emissions or scope two. But as I said, depending on the industry, that may not be a critical factor for an investor to look into for a specific business. Another one which is of topic recently is water management or water stress. So does your corporation or does the industry consume water for its operational services and and how is that managed? From a social perspective, it's very much looking at gender equality, looking at male-female ratios within board levels and management, looking into an ethnicity, so looking at native content versus expats, for instance. And then on the governance side, it very much looks into controlling factors and controlling factors when looking at frameworks. So again, we mentioned before the importance of the board these days and their fiduciary responsibility to shareholders and to the company. So governance starts to play a role where we see board members have that responsibility to ensure that C-suite, are, uh, C-suite have a framework in relation to ESG and how that integrates within the business. And then those operational risks are key metrics looked at and reviewed by C-suite in, terms of, in, in order to ensure that the business is seen as being sustainable, both to the environment and society. Mm-hmm. I'm curious here, are any social corporate social responsibility activities done by the company somehow included into any of the three categories? Social, probably. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think it can come down to people's opinion, but I'm a believer, and I think it's from my engineering background, that ESG and CSR are very different things to a corporation and to an investor. So, or to the public, I should say, not just investors. So, with ESG, I, I keep coming back to being industry specific investor focused metrics. So, we mentioned about GHG emissions, water stress, gender equality. But then with CSR, it's a corporate social responsibility. So, this is where I think, where I feel that companies doing good in the sense of donations, sponsoring of teams, helping local communities. This is where there's an outreach. But I don't feel, and in my perspective, that CSR has a material impact to, for instance, publicly listed companies, so therefore share price performance, or the risk to lenders in terms of, say, a bank and a corporate relationship. So they both have a part to play. 
But it is important, I feel, that corporates don't, particularly SMEs that are coming into this space and learning about ESG and sustainability, don't mix the two up because they are very different, but they both serve a purpose. Okay, that's very important that you you tell it to me. This year, World Economic Forum in Switzerland, the summit shared awareness that standard business practices need to change if companies and people they employ are going to survive this century. That was actually the beginning of, of the summit. Are we going, it, it started off with the question, are we going to survive through this century? And for example, the session called Making ESG Reporting More Science Than Art addressed the simple idea that we lack a consistent set of standards for measuring how companies perform on non-financial part. What's your take on that? Should ESG be science or art? <laughs> Definitely science, not art. Leave CSR to be the, I wouldn't say art, but the immaterial component when it comes to material disclosure. Again, this is why when we researched and looked at ESG tech at the 200 plus frameworks created by various non-for-profit or for-profit organizations, that we keep leaning towards SASB because it has these metrics that are qualitative and quantitative. So it takes away, for instance, the guessing work of a corporate who may not understand exactly what they need to report on and therefore gives them a clean and clean and concise protocol to follow. You'll be very surprised that a lot of these metrics, again, in SASB are already connected to metrics that a good business practice already covers. So we look at, again, operational risk, that these are metrics that a, a good business would be monitoring in order to ensure that their business is functioning at its best and optimal capabilities. In terms of your comments related to ranking of companies and, and ESG reports being more generic, I have a I have a, a challenge that sustainability and, and the ranking systems of, of the past, we look at the large players, S&P, Moody's, played its role in the last 100 years of, of helping people who didn't have the ability to find out and research for themselves just how good a business can be. And I feel that we need to be moving towards benchmarking of companies based on granular level metrics. And what I mean by that is, normalizing data so that we can look at, for instance, the agricultural market and compare a $2 billion company with a $100 million company by looking at how much GHG scope one emissions release per tonne of crop. And that's something which then gives the freedom to the investor or to the, the reader to determine and weight which metrics are more important to them, whether it be the environmental, social or governance, and move away from a third party body selecting which is more valuable and weight it in a way that then we get the scores of A++, A-, B-, minus because, yeah, it, it seems to be more of a dated process, in my opinion. What is this A++, B-, minus? whose ranking it is? So that's, that's the current standards we see is that it takes into account various metrics and then provides a scoring for a company. So there's the Rebecca Sam's um, scoring, there's Moody's, S&P, MSCI, Refinitiv, they all have their methodologies to or sustainalytics to, to rank a company against its peers. But again, that would mean that certain metrics need to be weighed against another metrics, which then has, without trying, some form of bias opinion as to what is more important than others. Okay. And this is something you include in the ESG tech, how does the platform work? No, so we don't include any any rankings as such. So we're very much focused on benchmarking. So our platform works by any corporation logging on and able to create their own ESG report using the SASB framework. So they go through a tutorial process, which tells them the protocol and then gives them the ability to fill in the information requested. At the end of it, then they're able to print a report and then periodically create a new report and see their trend lines for individual metrics. So they can start to look at, see whether they're improving in a positive or negative way for a specific metrics. Our goal is to, once the data set grows inside, is for a particular corporate then to select a metric. So again, if we use agriculture as an example, and then for them to look at, okay, well, what is the mean average for a particular region for GHG emissions per tonne of crop, particularly for the crop that they're growing? And then they will be able to see 
where they sit on a, a graph or a, a dot table of where they sit in comparison to their competitors. So the data remains private, but they're able to then get that direct insight to understand whether are they above the mean average, are they below the mean average, are they at top of their their class, or are they bottom and they need to improve. This kind of report, and I know that sustainability report and climate report and is still voluntary, right? When do you think and what should happen for this sort of data to become compulsory? Yeah, that's a great question. So we see that there is, for a better word, compulsory requirements from some of the stock exchanges. However, the details which they ask to provide purely would say in accordance with GRI or in accordance with SASB. We, this, the second part where we see is the EU taxonomy, where we're seeing regulatory requirements come into play in Europe, where companies are now having to disclose, say, for instance, their GHG emissions or, or their water consumption. My, my push and my drive is that more and more companies will report if there is that incentive. And that's why at ESG Tech, we focus on building relationships with multinational banks, where they use our platform to create a communication piece between their corporate clients in order to offer their corporate clients a better service, but at the same time be able to, again, incentivize them by de-risking them on their own balance sheet and then providing them with, again, the option of potential discounted capital or extended credit because they're able to provide such information to do so. Out of curiosity, which country is the most advanced according to your data, like your internal data in terms of ESGs and report and then enforcing this on the companies? That's a very good question. We see that this has a, been a talking topic for Europe for the most period of time and then followed by the US. So just naturally over a time period, we see more companies within Europe disclosing information. However, an interesting fact, which, which I'm a big supporter of, is that we're seeing material disclosure in the form of ESG reporting being a great communication piece for foreign direct investment. So a way for Southeast Asian countries where ESG tech's located in Singapore is a way of them to communicate with foreign investment. So to show them that here are our metrics, this is how we, this is how we're performing and provide that level of transparency that company, the first world countries like, you know, sorry, first world regions like Europe and the US look for when they're investing in emerging markets. And this is really becoming a, a trend. I think this is where it becomes sort of compulsory, even though on the level of perception, something like that, it's not compulsory by law, but the foreign investors will look into your non-financial data before taking the final decision. Look, very much so. So there is a, there is a benchmarking system called Gresby and it focuses on real estate and infrastructure and we've seen over each year Gresby's had more and more real estate and RIT funds donate their information to then be ranked and it was interesting to hear that a, a big reason for that was that if you weren't on the Gresby list then asset managers weren't going to take you into consideration so it's almost kind of now having to have that public notification that we're okay with being transparent. And if not, then asset managers are asking the question, well, why aren't you? And if there's not a legitimate reason behind it, then it's only going to have a negative effect on on your business when looking for finance, for instance. Oh, what, a, what a cool time we live in now that it's becoming like, you know, people themselves reinforce this sort of data because they they want to know they have to know and their decision really depends on on this andrew what's your understanding of sustainability how do you see what it is so in my opinion sustainability is longevity in a business and for a business to be here in the future they need to be looking at internal risks external risks so as i mentioned before i, I come i'm an engineer by trade so Looking at operational risk is what I did day in, day out. And there was a key reason for that. That was to ensure that you know projects were completed safely but would exist in the future. And I think that's a key part when businesses now hear the word sustainability. It doesn't necessarily need to be green, for instance, straight away. We know that there are industries that cannot be green. We look at you know mining, for instance. You will have people say that there is no way a mining company can be green. But it doesn't mean it can't be sustainable for the current economy. 
And that's a key driver too, is that we can't blacklist particular industries for the sake of it because they're not green. Unless there is technology ready to replace it and allowing those businesses to evolve into a new form of business, it's a challenge to just completely ban something without the, there being a replacement for society to continue forward with. Nice. Probably the last question for today because I'm still full of questions. <laughs> Let's say I have a company or okay, the company exists. They keep on hearing ESG, climate reporting, sustainability reporting, important investors, stakeholders, and they are lost in all of these buzzwords. They don't know where to start. What would you suggest? Let's say they are really committed. They want to to start, you know, touching and tasting this ESG data of their own, where would they, where do they have to start? What would you suggest them to do first? And at which point should they approach you or ESG tech platform for help? I think starting where a comp corporate would start I would say logging on to sasb.org, looking up their industry and sector that they operate in, and then having a look at the industry-specific investor-focused metrics that SASB selected for them. And they'll be amazed to see how many of those metrics should already be KPIs that they're tracking from an operational perspective. Once they see that, then I'm, I think they'll be less alarmed about what the next processes will need to be. And that's where we try to jump in. So providing them a cloud-based platform for them to start to track all of their metrics and take that data and then turn it into insight. So that is one key point where we try and work with corporates is that it's one thing to do an accounting exercise and ag aggregate the data, but the best thing next is then to gain insight from that. Uh, and that's what we hope to do with each and every one of our corporate clients. Cool. Thank you very much, Andrew for the interview, for sharing with me your insights. It really cleared a lot of confused information in my head. I hope listeners will enjoy it too. Thank you very much again and have a great day. Terrific. Thank you very much, Anna, for having us on your podcast and look forward to talking to you and your listeners again soon. Thanks. Ciao. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. In case you still have any questions or suggestions how to explore the ESG topic more, please approach me or Andrew. Let us know your feedback. We would be very happy and excited to, to have your feedback. If you like the podcast, please leave a review, rate, comment on the platform you're listening on. I guess we are now available on 11 platforms. Um, it helps other people to discover the podcast and your opinion certainly matters. Thank you for listening and until next time, take care, stay sustainable.